Hello everyone, can you hear me well? I'm Gabriel and I'm Head of Customer Solutions for MasterCard Southeast Europe. Uh, I would like to thank Eurobank for getting us here to talk about um, artificial intelligence with you. Um, I would start with the thing that everybody talks about, ChatGPT, right? That has taken the world by storm um, and I think these days everybody talks about it. It's probably one of those moments of, oh no, not that again. We've heard that before. And I think we have, but it was the moment that has changed the world in terms of what AI means to people. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was visiting a global AI company, um, which, is the, which is a leader in B2B. Uh, they've been doing this for years, right? Chat GPT was an idea probably then, and they've been doing this for years, but they've decided to present themselves by saying what they do in comparison with Chat GPT, right? So that was not something that was happening a couple of months ago, but now it is there. Now, <coughs> I would say that when it comes to AI, it's on the front page of any roadmap of any global company and venture capital firm in the world. Um, $200 billion were spent in 2022 to make this better. The AI market is expected to um, grow sevenfold over the next five years. Uh, and from the companies that we talk to, 50% of them use AI for at least one business function. And there's good reason for that because AI can be used for so many things. Actually, there's very few things where AI cannot be used to exponentially grow and improve what we do today. Um, companies around the world have started using um, the AI for things like knowledge distribution. You know to get your people, your employees, to find exactly what they're looking for when they need it. Big companies have vast amounts of data. It becomes a hassle to search through. But now you can do that, and actually there are companies doing that. Or things about um, finance management. For big companies, understanding where their revenues are going to be, especially if they operate in multiple countries, that's a very hard task, especially with things like nationalism, um, geopolitical risks, climate change risks. That's very, very hard to do, but you can do that with AI. MasterCard uses it as well, so thank you very much. Um, what about things like building the marketing materials in hours from, from scratch, rather than weeks and dozens of people doing their work? Or even simpler things like a call center agent being able to help a customer fast, you know, without getting, getting um, offended by an angry tone that the customer may have. I think we all know those things, right? Or even worse, ending up the conversation with a more frustrated customer than they've started with. That's possible today, that's being done. And these are just a few cases that are being used um, out there. Now, in terms of MasterCard, we've started our AI journey uh, middle of last decade with the aim of bringing even more security to the billions of transactions that go through our network. Um, Today, all of our transactions are being scored for risk, uh, and those scores are, giving, are given to the issuers so that they can, approve, they can update their fraud policies and fraud, fraud management processes so that they can make better sense out of them. We are using AI for helping customers and partners to better understand their cybersecurity posture and take super targeted measures into getting themselves more protected. And finally, we've been using um, AI for helping our customers and partners and retailers across the world to make better sense of their data uh, and ultimately giving them uh, tools to provide personalized shopping experiences to their customers. Um, now, AI is not new, right? We've seen forms of AI for years and years now. But there are three factors that got us to the point where we are now. Um, probably the easiest one to grasp would be the computing power. I mean, AI is notoriously hungry for power. Um, but now with the fabulous uh, developments in cloud computing, that power is available. It's not cheap, right? So I think you've all read news about ChatGPT saying the cost of one interrogation is very high, but that's going down. Um, another thing which has helped us to get where we are now is um, availability of curated data sets. Structured data, unstructured data, they're now a lot better than they used to be, and we can use those data sets to train our AI models. And then thirdly, uh, nothing could be done without it, the algorithms, especially the neural networks. That's where all those hundreds of billions of dollars have 
gone into. Um, still, AI is fairly new, and there are several topics that still need to be worked out, still need to be developed, still need to be uh, made better. Uh, things like bias in the data sets. I think we've all heard stories of Apple when they've launched their Face ID. They figured that they have a bias in their data, and they were somehow ab more able to figure out Caucasian faces rather than um, Asian faces, right? For argument's sake. Um, things like the spread of fake information and deep fakes. They're much more difficult to figure out today, almost close to impossible, right? And I think you, we, you, we have all seen things like that. Um, Cybersecurity risks, um, or even data privacy issues. They're all top of mind for the industry, they're all top of mind for the regulators out there. Now, for the next hour or so, uh, we'll be talking to you about what MasterCard thinks uh, the AI can be used for in terms of developing the world of commerce. Um, for that, I have the pleasure of having two very special guests. Uh, Mr. Neil Taylor, who's a senior vice president for MasterCard Data Strategy, and <laughs> Mr. David Kerrigan, who is a lecturer for Stanford. Uh, he's the author of numerous books, and he's a consultant for MasterCard Labs back in Dublin. We will be having a panel at the end of their presentations, where we'll be very happy to take your questions. Having said that, please join me in welcoming Neil, and hope you'll have a great time. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we're in the matrix. OK, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for that welcome. Um, and uh, first off, I think uh, Gabrielle did an excellent introduction there to the sort of very broad topic that is artificial intelligence. Um, but what I want to do is to talk to you today about where we see some of the change and opportunity and some of the background to what's actually happening in the development that we're undertaking and that others in the market are undertaking. Um, but first I want to sort of start around the most important aspect of that, which is the data side. So I've split this presentation into sort of two sections, the first around data, the second part around the generative AI and the implications, because without either the data or the AI, we don't have a complete solution. So first off, very much want to talk about the data aspects of this. And really, it starts with some foundation principles. And these have been principles that MasterCard has lived by for a very long time. And they serve us today, even in the world of artificial intelligence and, uh, and new frontier opportunities. The first is that it's not our data. The data belongs to each individual that has helped to generate it through their transactions, through their account activity, through their loyalty activity. So we fundamentally believe that the data that people generate belongs to the people that have generated it. And that includes the businesses that generate data as well. Um, we therefore enable individuals to control that data. So we have a global site, um, part of what our team looks after, which is was part of our rollout for GDPR many, many years ago. Uh, and it enables customers to, and cardholders to understand what data do we hold about them, how is their data used, and it gives them the opportunity to either correct that data or to tell us not to process that data. So it's a fundamental to how we actually operate with data amongst us. The third principle is that those that generate the data should benefit from its use. We have many, many different services and products, but whenever our product development teams are thinking about how to create new products, how to develop new services, and they're going to be using the data, they must think about how the original generators of that data, how the original cardholders are going to benefit from the product or service that they're going to build. So it must be for the betterment of the people that originally contributed the data. And then the final thing is we must protect it. Uh, and that's not just in the physical sense, that's also in the responsible use sense. So not only should we ensure that data is encrypted, uh, is securely actively used, we must ensure that it also follows respectful privacy principles. So we follow privacy by design, data minimization, aspects like that become very important to us and part of our daily vocabulary. 
And from that foundation is where we then go on to understand and build our data journey. So, first aspect, data we very much see as the new value creator. What you're seeing up here is, is three layers, and uh, apologies if they're a little bit small on the, the screen, even though the size of the screen is huge. Um, what I'll do is I'll point out a few of these and explain what we're doing and what we're thinking about. So data is being created and used across vast different technology ecosystems. And those range from healthcare and government, learning and development, so I think you might hear from David some examples around that. Um, a very important one of e-commerce and retail, wrapping round through. All of these industries are all starting to understand how do they use data, how do they use data within their own industry, but they also need to start thinking about what does this mean cross-sector, because the customer is sitting at the central of all of this. The user, the customer, is engaging in possibly multiple of these sectors. So therefore, we go one step in and we start to think about what does this mean from a data perspective? What does this mean when data, for example, is required to prove provenance? So how do we know that the particular service or product that we're providing, or that we're buying, is compliant with regulations or has gone through supply chain testing? Yeah, how do we know that? How do we prove that? And it's data that's at the heart of that. Yeah, how do we understand data as an experience? If you think about the travel industry post-COVID, there's been a fundamental shift from people who are traveling for leisure, buying goods and items, to buying experiences. We see this in... Um, so we, we uh, create a lot of economic outlook activity, both for uh, industry and for governments, and what we're seeing in that is, is a transformation in the need or the desire of tourists and travellers to switch from that, I want to buy a product, I'm going to go shopping, to I'm going to have an experience. And that changes the nature of the data that's associated with the purchase and the transaction. How do we recognise that? How do we understand that? How do we see that? How do we use that to help make better decisions about how to serve that customer? And we go all the way through and we think about data as utility in action. We think about data as a synthetic. And further into that ring, we then think about well, what does this mean generally? So we have all these aspects of data. What does that mean? Okay, so we have to think about security and privacy. We have to think about social impact and, uh, and ethics. We have to think about transparency and control and offering, as we talked about our principles earlier. So there's a lot happening. I'm just going to dive in into one of these little blue circles, which is going to become increasingly important to us, uh, which is very much around uh, digital um, identity. My little clicker works, there we go. So data is identity and authentication. So if you think about your own individual lives and how you go through the different stages, so. You might, yeah, you have a career, you come to work, you have an access card that lets you into the building. It's part of your digital identity. You have uh, uh, a password or a login token to get into the network. It's another part of your digital identity. When you then go online to go shopping, yeah, you have further identities. You have usernames, you have passwords, you have um, other uh, uh, pieces of identity that identify you to a particular retailer or to a particular payment. When you think about insurance or when you think about healthcare, you're being identified again in different uh, areas. And all of those form a slightly different picture in the digital world as to who you are. Who is Neil Taylor in the digital world when he's interacting with all of these different services? How does that then transfer across and become... Yeah, uh, uh, an, an interaction that becomes much more seamless and, uh, uh, and uh, creating value as you go through. So we've already seen, for example, in, in Scandinavia that your um, personal identifier is now used to log into your work systems. It's also now used to log into your banking networks and is shortly being used to be able to log into other services and facilities. So a single digital identity is becoming quite an interesting concept across Europe and also um, elsewhere. And whilst it sounds straightforward at the beginning, 
if you think about the implications from a retail perspective and from a commerce perspective of what it means to have this tokenized identity and how that then interacts with your systems becomes quite important. And then finally that, there's kind of the, the, the last slide on the data piece. That data is then generating and uh, enabling a whole view of an individual or of a business across all those different real or augmented worlds. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to use, and, and my colleague was joking with me earlier, I'm not going to use the metaverse term, um, but if you think about that, that digital environment and all the different aspects of where we are, and you think about the physical re retail environment as well, how do you blend loyalty into that? How do you ensure that loyalty becomes something that um, is operational at an individual level? We have all the necessary data now and capabilities to understand who is, who is Neil as an individual. You know, what are my preferences and tools? So how do we go about blending that into a loyalty aspect? How do we think about financing options? Somebody comes to a checkout. You know, either, the, either that's a physical checkout or an online checkout. How do we offer them different payment options? Is it buy now, pay later? You know, is it installments? Um, you know, is it immediate cash on delivery? What do we do there? Personalized suggestions. How do we make recommendations in real time based on a combination of what do we know about the individual and what it is that they have in their basket at the time? And again, you think about going slightly further on, the consumers and the businesses, customers will also be using these tools to themselves enable their shopping and purchasing and, uh, and leisure activities. Yeah, the ability to compare and contrast, the ability to obtain recommendations and product recommendations, the ability to engage with social media to be able to see what others have experienced with a particular product or service. So we have all of this sort of streaming, streaming through. And the kind of the piece is, okay, so what's the, um, what do we do with that? Um, all of this extra data. Yeah, we need intelligence. We need um, the ability to understand and access that data. And that data is going to come in many, many different formats, structured and unstructured. And we have to try and make sense of all this. You know, all of these individual data points that are floating around, we're looking for patterns in there. We're looking to understand you know, those small nuggets of information that are going to help us generate a new experience and generate a new sale. And so, if, these are, if the data points are, are what we have, it's enabling artificial intelligence to do what it really does, which is that vast, very fast analysis in near real time of all the different um, components, all the different data points that are in there, enabling us to change as well as enabling others to help change their own businesses. So in the second part, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what we mean by generative AI and what's actually happening with it. So, Gen AI, Gen AI. Um, okay, let's we'll start with some, some, some basics, so we're kind of all on the, the fundamentals. Uh, you heard um, Gavi talk about how MasterCard has been using artificial intelligence really since um, the, the, the middle of the last decade. And that's always traditionally been in that algorithmic, predictive, structured environment. So we've been looking at data that is uh, transactions, very nice structured transactions, or maybe product information, you know, SKUs, things like that, that are all very structured and straightforward. Yeah, it's termed sort of supervised learning, and yeah, example was given for, for, for fraud models. And we, uh, we try and predict likely future spend or likelihood of fraud. When we move into the generative space, then we're using existing data to create and generate new content, new data. So that might be a single purpose tool. So one of the tools that we use um, enables us to generate completely new synthetic data that allows us to test and model our counter-fraud tools. 
so that when we actually launch them into the marketplace, we have a fairly we have a high degree of confidence that they're going to operate as they, as they should. The piece that has got everybody talking and excited and why there's conferences at Bletchley Park in the UK and why the US and Chinese are all talking about it is the foundational models or sometimes known as the frontier models. And this is where you're taking large amounts of unstructured data and either using unsupervised or semi-supervised learning we're creating new content as a consequence, and that can be adapted to perform all sorts of different um, individual tasks. So on that basis, what are we actually seeing and thinking about uh, uh, and understanding? So the first piece that we're seeing as, as, as change already is the creation of synthetically generated marketing messages, i.e. marketing messages that are generated by a machine and take targeted at individuals. And yeah, we anticipate this rising, um, and we've been in discussions with Gartner about this. Their predictions around yeah, possibly even underrepresenting the growth of this now. But we think yeah, it, by 2027, 90% growth in the amount of marketing messages created synthetically by machine. In terms of efficiency and effectiveness, task completion and increased productivity, there was an initial thought that artificial intelligence would be limited to some fairly routine tasks. It would be put to work for administrative tasks. Actually, the latest research from Boston Consulting Group is suggesting that the biggest impact is going to be knowledge workers. Yeah, those of us that have to create and develop reporting, content, um, and uh, even... Uh, um, uh, advice around financial services, for example, or legal and tax areas, that's going to have a, 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 a huge change. The one that we're immediately working on is coding. So actually being able to, if, if any of you have, um, uh, I'm going to say it's a reasonably young audience, so if any of you have done coding courses or the rest of it, or if you've got kids that have tried coding, throwing code into ChatGVT or some of the other online tools gives you a very efficient way of identifying errors and mistakes. How do you do that without compromising your intellectual property, though? Come, we'll come back to that point. And then customer support. The increase of, of customer support agents across all of these um, sectors and services um, is growing again at a, at a rapid rate. And as, as Gabby said, this is something we're also enabling for customers. Um, some examples. Um, I picked some random examples, there are many, many of them, I'm sure you're going to see some more later on as well. But Stripe, for example, are using ChatBT4 to, um, uh, to power their customer support chatbot. Um, Shopify are using GenAI to help merchants generate product descriptions when they load their products onto the website. Um, Morgan Stanley is using it for an internal customer support chatbot. It's a very interesting use actually because their financial advisors are getting access to the thought power of generative AI and are helping translate that to their customers. So they're not enabling the customers to access it directly, but they are empowering their advisors to have the support of AI. And again, Chase there, um, uh, again, using chatbox, chatbots to provide investment advice um, directly. Um, again, yeah, we're, we're taking a similar approach. We're doing similar things. Um, we're creating fake data to test um, fraud systems and anti-money laundering. Um, we're levering foundational models to create uh, marketing content. Um, we do have some very strict controls around this at the moment. Um, that's, that's, that's my team that are responsible for that, not always to the satisfaction of some of my colleagues sitting around the room. Um, but we are, making, we are making sure that we're being very careful, especially with customer data. We have not and will not at this point in time use customer data in open API, in open AI scenarios, and we won't put our own intellectual property into those services yet. Again, comes back to another point in a moment. Um, we're piloting some of these models for internal um, and external chats as well. But again, what, that, what we have to remember is that there's a fairly complex landscape behind some of this. If you're an individual sole trader, 
you can go to ChatGPT and say, OK, I want to create a better product description for myself, or I want to create some better marketing material. You can go in there and you can type it in. But as an enterprise, at an enterprise scale, there's some substantial hurdles to overcome. Um, the first of which is the hardware. Yeah, the, 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 the sudden desire or the sudden realization that graphical processing units were just the thing to power artificial intelligence has completely changed the market and the pricing structure for GPUs. So if you had NVIDIA stocks, well done. Um, they are doing fantastically well. Um, the next is then, how do you then platform that? How do you provide access to that hardware? Yeah, there's very few organizations around the world that are going to go directly to NVIDIA or Intel, buy the chips necessary, and build their own infrastructure around it. Um, most are going to use platforms that enable that access. So the clouds, Google, Azure, AWS. And then which models um, are you going to, to, to choose to build upon? Again, there's, there's a growing number of these models out there. Um, you know, Llama 2, Palm, GPT-4, and more are coming. Uh, and so how do we enable that connection? And then once you've chosen the model, how are you going to manage that? How are you actually going to tune the model to deliver exactly what it is that you need? How are you going to help it understand? And so again, there's a whole set of um, tools and, and infrastructure and, uh, and software applications being built to do that. And then finally, you have the applications on top of that that actually solve the use cases. And so far, we've, 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 we as an industry have been reasonably unimaginative about that. Mostly of what we're doing at the moment is simply converting what we already do today into an artificial intelligence way of doing it, which is great for productivity and great for efficiency. It's not really tapped into the innovation yet that is going to have the opportunity for, for AI in the future. And then once you have um, started to understand and start to think about, comes kind of the most important aspect, which is how do you do governance? How do you create a framework within which you can develop artificial intelligence in a way that is responsible, trustworthy, and in particular a way that supports regulatory uh, engagement and compliance. Um, <coughs> there are, as you're probably well aware, various regulators around the world all looking at how do you regulate artificial intelligence? Should you regulate artificial intelligence? Um, the UK, for example, uh, took the view fairly early on that actually what we want to do is regulate the outcome. And for that, they believed that there was sufficient law already in place through human rights, copyright, um, uh, the, um, uh, some of the software directives that exist in the UK, um, all of which meant that actually the output was relatively well known. They're slightly changing their idea on that. Um, the European Commission, on the other hand, thinks that they need to be very prescriptive about how you do AI. Um, and that, therefore, will, di uh, will, will dictate the outcome. A very different approach. The US is all still a little bit kind of lost at sea. Um, yeah, I think we had yesterday um, uh, an executive order released from the White House that talks about the fact that AI should be responsible and should be regulated. It doesn't really give answers as to how. Um, and that vacuum is really being taken up by state legislatures who are uh, starting to, to regulate at the state level. So in New York, for example, if you use artificial intelligence to hire people, then you have to declare that and you have to make that visible and there has to be a route to, um, a, a, a response route if they don't like the outcome. So at MasterCard, um, over the last sort of 10 years or so, we've been working on what does our governance framework look like. First is to understand the purpose. Yeah, what is the purpose of the AI that we are developing? And that's quite complicated when it comes to a general purpose model. Um, but that's you know, the point being, if we go back to our original principles, you know, the, whatever we're doing with the data should be benefiting the individuals in some way. So purpose is important. Does it comply with our principles? Then do we have the necessary data to actually build and sustain and maintain the model? 
Yeah. Can we evaluate it for quality, data for quality? Is it compliant? Is it sufficient timeliness? Are we getting it regularly enough? Is that use case and the model design fit for purpose? So once we've understood what the original purpose is, what the data is there, how do we think about minimizing bias? Um, we do a lot of work um, supporting various agencies around the world. Um, one of the ones we do um, is to provide uh, what's called Community Pass in Africa, which is um, an identity card that also acts as a, as a money store and a services store. And in order to access that, because there are not sufficient connected devices there, the data is held on the card and it's biometrics as well. So you have the combination of biometrics, data, security, encryption, et cetera, et cetera. How you then ensure that that card is paired with an individual is extremely important. And it's extremely important that we don't end up with biases in the system. So for example, if we rely on a system that uses fingerprints, that's very biased against farmers because farmers, you've ever worked on the land, yet there are no fingerprints left. So you have to ensure that you can do a combination of palm and face. How we maintain and do all that, incredibly important in terms of understanding bias uh, and, and how that's used. We then score each model. So we then assess the model and say, OK, are we talking a fairly low risk tool here? So is this, is this just simply, um, it might be optimizing some of our cash management systems. Yeah, it might be optimizing our server uptime. Uh, so actually fairly low risk. We're not dealing with personal data. Uh, we're not dealing with individuals. We've just put models. We have thousands and thousands of artificial intelligence models running across the whole of MasterCard. Most of them are in our finance and IT systems helping maintain, as I say, cash balances, server uptime, areas like that. We're increasingly seeing them used in employee systems, so recommending projects to work on. Uh, how do we ensure that there's no bias that they're always recommending to male populations or female populations? Um, one of the biggest challenges that our industry in AI has at the moment is engagement. Engagement from different groups of people. So approximately, approximately 50, 55% of men have engaged with artificial intelligence in some way or another, either through their work or through their social life. By contrast, only 35% of women have engaged with artificial intelligence, either through their work or through their personal life. Yeah, it's important to recognize that we also have a responsibility to ensure that there's no bias uh, in the outcomes and in the activity as well. So if we're training data, we have to make sure that we're training data that's going to work for, for both men and female, not just, not just the men. Um, once we've done that, we'll assess What's the output? What's the actual development? Then we have mostly peer-reviewed. Um, if it's a high-risk environment, we'll do uh, a slightly higher one. And then we launch it, and then we monitor it. And then we have to make sure it doesn't drift. So they have a tendency to go sideways. And occasionally, they fall over. They're very fragile. A lot of our AI models are really quite fragile. If the data going into them is, is a little unexpected, or is you know, not quite uh, as, as, as uh, structured as it could be, or it was expecting unstructured and get structured or vice versa, then the models have a hard time. So again, we have to use tools and technology to make sure that these models are all doing what they should be doing and haven't started drifting away from their original purpose. And then, yeah, that really brings us into, you know, what does this governance framework support? Well, it supports understanding the risks. So... Um, I, I, I love to tell you, every new piece of technology, you have to have a new set of terms to describe what are just errors and mistakes. So hallucinations. If you haven't heard this term, hallucinations, it's basically the model coming up make-believe something. It's a bit like having a nightmare. You suddenly wake up and you go, oh, well, thank goodness that wasn't real. The AI doesn't have that ability to wake up, so we call it hallucinations. Um, yeah, how do we ensure we don't lose confidential data? Yeah, if we suddenly start putting all our uh, customer data into ChatGPT, it's there, it's out on the web. How do we make sure that doesn't happen? How do we make sure when we're building our models that we're not impinging on other people's IP? Um, yeah, a great example is 
Um, you might use, um, let's say we're going to use a sports star as a brand ambassador. That brand ambassador doesn't have the ability to turn up at a particular event because they happen to be competing somewhere. Great, let's do a, an artificial intelligence image and version of them and create a new video. That's fantastic if you have all the original copyrights to the material you're going to use. But surprisingly, when it comes to images, it's not the individual that owns the image copyright, it's the photographer that took it. So if you're going to create an artificial intelligence, uh, a, a generated video image of somebody, you might have that individual's permission to say, yeah, of course you can, no problem. But the content is from photographs and video that others own the copyright to. So again, we have to think about how we, how we do that. And then how do we explain the decisions and the outcomes to the individuals that are affected? So if you've got a loan application, for example, or you're going to go online and you say, I want to buy this TV, and I'm going to use buy now, pay later, or credit, or something else, and it comes back and says, no, you're refused. How do you explain to somebody why that decision was taken? It's very important to gain their ongoing trust and their um, uh, activity and their uh, loyalty to do that. And then, you know, how do we sure we're not amplifying bias, things like that? There are lots and lots of controls. I've just picked out three of some of the key ones that we're doing. Prompt engineering um, is another term you'll become more and more familiar with. Basically, all it means is how do you ask the question of the AI? If you're trying to understand um, which of my customers um, is most likely to purchase this particular product, you could ask that in many different ways. Yeah, you could simply write which of my customers will, will buy this product. But actually, you're not really interested in that. You want to know which of my product, which of my customers will buy this in the next two weeks if I send an offer. Um, you know, we have products like Test and Learn that, that, that do this sort of, uh, sort of trial and error activity, but in, in a virtual space. But if you think about that, the actual creation of the question that you're going to ask of the AI and therefore making sure there's no IP in it, there's no confidential data in it, there's nothing that's going to upset or offend from a personal perspective, all known as prompt engineering. Um, fine tuning, adjusting the parameters of the model so that, that its performance for a specific task is as good as it can get. Um, again, it's, 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 it's a bit of an art form. It's a combination of science and art, which I think is why so many people get fascinated by it, is, you know, you can have all the degrees you want, but if somebody comes along and say, what happens if we just tweak that a bit, and all of a sudden it's better, you go, okay, well done. Um, and then human in the loop. Um, Hittle, Hittle. Um, basically, do you have the ability within what you're designing and developing for a, a human to review the output, or at least to understand and explain what was going on? Yeah, the expectations from customers are growing day by day. Yeah, if, we go, if we go back and we think about the data piece and think what customers um, will have, they may, for example, want to be able to do something very simple. They might want to share their calendar with you. Why is that? Because actually that calendar is going to say when they're on holiday. So when they come to an e-commerce site for clothing and it knows that there's a holiday coming up, why does the shopping site start to show winter clothing when they're going to Barbados for a late summer holiday or a winter sun holiday? It's a very simple, for a customer, that seems quite straightforward. I'll share my calendar, and therefore it should narrow down the search parameters for the clothes that you might have in stock. But actually, that requires a combination of some structured data. It requires you understanding what your stock is. It requires you understanding what season that's suitable for. It requires the system to understand what does the calendar entry mean. So you're then talking unstructured data. And then it requires it to then search through and combine, present it back in a way that is, from a user perspective, as, as valuable as possible. How do you do all that? By engineering all the prompts and doing all the fine tuning and not ensuring bias um, is, you know, is part of our challenge. So basically bringing all that together in effect, we have a combination of data and artificial intelligence, and we end up with, at the end of it, a mixed reality
consumer environment. There will be no difference between online and offline shopping. There will be very... Uh, how do you then go from one to the other seamlessly? So with that, um, thank you very much. I hope I've uh, stuck to my time. I think I'm, I think I'm handing over to, uh, to David. There you go, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I feel a lot of pressure now because I've been given this session where you've all been sat here for 90 minutes and you're starting to get restless and I have to keep you entertained. So I will do that as best I can. I'm not paid by the slide, so I don't have to get to the end of it. But I'm going to start with some love for this corner. I'm going to come talk down here. I will be back over to you. But as I go around the world talking about artificial intelligence, I find that every culture has a parable about the boy, the child who cried wolf. And I'm met with skepticism. Because people are like, oh look, he's here to tell me about the next big thing. Two years ago, he was here to tell me that blockchain was going to change everything. And last year, he came back and he told me it was all about the metaverse. So why is he back again? And you know what? I get that. So I used to run a network of 75 stores. I know what it's like to be a retailer. And I know that most of you are itching to look at your sales number updates on your phones now. You don't really want to be sat here because you don't have time for strategy. So well done for making that time. And I'm going to do everything I can to make it as useful as possible for you. Because I know you're grappling with these kinds of headlines where you see all of the hype. People, it's a game changer. It's going to take over absolutely everything. The world is never going to be the same. But I want to go beyond the hype. I want the next 40 minutes or so to be practical, to be really useful to you. Because otherwise, I've done a terrible job and I should have stayed at home. I want you to get something out of this. So there are no bad questions. If you want, there's a panel at the end where we'll have a nice debate, but if you want to jump in and ask a question, that's fine too. But I'm going to start off by asking you a question, because why should I have all the fun? So I'm going to do a quick check to see how are you feeling about artificial intelligence. And I'm going to give you four options. And then I'm going to ask the question again at the end and see if you've changed your mind. So you're not committed to a particular answer now. You will be allowed to change your mind. And there's no way I'm going to remember who's changed their mind. So be honest. So I'm going to ask you in a minute how you feel about AI. Are you thrilled? Is it exciting? Is it something that you're like, yeah, do you know what? I'm really glad I'm learning more about this and it's going to make things better. Or are you terrified? You're like, okay, this is really worrying. This is bad. This is going to make my life harder. It's going to make my life worse. Your third option then is actually it's quite trivial. I don't really care. I don't think it's a big deal. I think, you know, he's crying wolf. And your fourth option is it's too soon to tell. Now, the fourth option will be gone the next time I ask the question. So you've got 40 minutes to make up your mind about what it means. So, hands up all the people who are number one. And hands up all the people who are number two. Okay, so at least we have three honest people in the room. I appreciate that. <laughs> the others are all, no, I'm too brave. I'm not frightened. But I know a lot of people are, and that's okay. How many people think it's trivial? How many people think there's no big deal? Okay, couple. And how many people, it's too soon, don't know yet? Okay, 
great. So I have to change your minds in the next 38 minutes I have left now to do that. Now, before I talk about the importance of AI, I just want to reiterate the importance of retail. So retail is such an important sector. It's so important from a payments point of view. But it's also really important from a customer experience point of view. So it defines how customers experience services. And what you see in retail often transfers into other areas. So people see, I saw earlier on the screen, thankfully I recognized the logo, I didn't know what else was going on on the slide, but I saw mention of Amazon Go, which is a fantastic customer experience. But now people compare to that. So people look to retail for leadership, they look for innovation, they look for customer experience. And it also shows the way that consumers are thinking. It shows the direction that consumers are going and what are their priorities. And everybody talks about how fast AI is happening. Well, consumer change is happening at a terrifying pace as well. Now, when I talk about retail, there, of course, isn't just one retail. It would make life so much easier if there was. But retail covers so many areas. It covers everything from a sole trader to a massive corporation. It covers us from online to physical stores and everything in between. And it covers everything from quick service restaurants to buying clothes to buying cars. So retail can include something that costs a very small amount of money or it can be a very large thing. So there is no one retail, but hopefully there's something in here today that appeals to you. So I've tried to please everybody, include as many examples as possible. So don't give up on me if some of the slides don't relate to you. There's one in there for you somewhere. And then the last point I want to make before we dive in too far is that consumers don't think in retail. Us in retail, we talk about KPIs, and we talk about channels, and we talk about performance. Consumers don't care. Consumers never think in channels. They think maybe in brands, but they think in solutions. They think in things they want to buy. They don't go, oh well, the head of online and the head of retail in that organization are very aligned on their channel plans. That's not how consumers think. So you shouldn't think like that either. And where you find yourselves today, retail is at this messy place in the middle, living between that intersection of consumers, of technology, and of course of commerce. So it's a complex thing. So give yourselves a break if you feel like it's hard. It is. But help is at hand as well as challenges. Now, retail has become the third largest employer of technology graduates. And it's number three behind, number one is technology companies, the big tech, and number two is finance. So very, very relevant for this audience today. And then it's a question of, okay, let's, this AI thing, what are, we, what are we seeing? What are we looking at here? What are we watching happening? What's unfolding before our eyes? And there are all of the usual suspects. All of the consultancy companies are all queuing up to offer reports with massive numbers about just how exciting this is. And the latest IDC one I saw, it pulled out that the two largest investors in AI are going to be our two groups, finance and retail. Now, as I talk about AI, I do always want to mention that there's an awful lot more going on. So the spotlight, the narrow focus has been on AI. But if we broaden out our focus, there are a load of other things that you need to somehow manage to keep your eye on as well. So it could be robotics, it could be virtual reality, it could be 
just generally doing a really good job without worrying about technology. So it is a broad stage that we need to talk about. But we'll focus primarily. So that agenda of the future is broad. We could talk about robotics, metaverse, but I'm going to focus on for today generative AI in particular. Now, it comes back to exactly one year ago. I've been waiting to give this talk again because last week I had to say almost a year, but now I can actually say it's been a year since OpenAI unleashed ChatGPT on the world. And it's become absolutely common. Everybody's talking about it. And it reminds me a bit, it's one of these acronyms that has come into use a bit like during the pandemic, everybody you met was suddenly a molecular biologist who said, oh, yeah, I had a PCR test. Nobody had a clue what that meant. And now everybody's going around talking about GPT as if they're computer scientists. And again, they don't know what that means. In case you're wondering, PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, which I'm sure most of you do remember from the pandemic. But GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. There's a test at the end, so make sure you remember this. So generative, it generates some new content. The P, the pre-trained, it's pre-trained on data. And T is the technical part, which is convenient because it also stands for transformer. That's the inner workings of the AI model. But it's actually not the most important acronym because GPT is just one example. And the actual category of technology is called LLM because the technology industry cannot help themselves. They must create acronyms before they create products. So they said, let's call it an LLM. So large language models, that's the category of technology. And GPT is just one example of that. And you may, depending on your scale and your needs, you might even develop your own large language model. So as Neil referenced, you know, we're seeing some of the big players who have the data and the power to do this, um, like the Bloombergs, like the Chases, like the JP Morgans. They're building their own large language models. But I like, obviously, to again, keep sure that everybody's awake. I throw in something controversial. And that's my controversial statement, that I don't think ChatGPT is the AI future. And people are like, oh, but, but, but I'm here to hear about how it is the future, so don't tell me it's not. But the large language models, the category, absolutely is the future. So remember, ChatGPT is just one example of the technology. It's not actually everything to do with AI. So the big question, how is this useful in retail? Let's explore that a bit more. But I'm going to ask another question again, because you're not asking me any questions. So I'm going to you know, show you how it works. So the role of AI in retail. I'm not going to repeat this one. It's not like the first question. So what do you think? the role of AI in retail is. Do you think it's going to be about personalization? Yes, so hands up for personalization. You're going to get a lot of exercise with your hands now, right? So up for personalization. Many people think marketing collateral creation. Is that going to be a big use? How about just retail operations? Is that? Now, I don't know whether you're tired putting your hand up or you just don't think. So, what about procurement? Is that going to be a big use? Well, actually, to everybody who's put their hands up, thank you for participating, but you're wrong. Because the, the correct answer is number five, and you should have waited for it. The correct answer is that it's all that and more. It's going to be absolutely everywhere. Because we're at this tipping point, an inflection point, in what technology can actually do. And if we break it down and we say, well, in the online space, what is, what's it going to do? It's going to improve customer service. 
it's going to improve product detail pages. It's going to improve recommendations. And in the physical retail world, it's going to improve the in-store experience. It's going to reduce shrinkage, theft. It's going to improve your merchandising. And it's going to enable simulation of physical stores without having to actually do something in the physical world, which is faster and cheaper, which are two words that we do really like. But as we talk about the technology, I'm going to keep coming back to the consumers. So what will the consumers be doing while we're sitting here debating AI? Consumers are not. They're outside buying things, which is great. But we need to keep them in mind. What are their new priorities? How will their shopping change? Will we have to deal with robots coming? And what new tools will AI give consumers? Because there's a terrible tendency for us to assume, as we talk about how we'll use technology, like it's ours, and it's up to us to decide. But consumers will have access to these technologies too. And they will find ways to make it useful for them. And underpinning everything is going to be speed and scale. Things that took a really long time to do are suddenly going to be very short. So big campaigns that used to take a lot of effort to build, you're going to be able to build them in an instant. Now, you don't have to put your hand up for this one, right? But a question is, you know, people say, OK, make it real. How is AI actually making a difference today for a retailer? So let's take an example from the big end of things. So would you pay $300 million to buy a new menu system? Well, most people, I think, will probably say no. But for McDonald's, it made sense. So they spent $300 million buying an AI company so that they could offer personalized menus. And if you look at it, that's the menu. I took that picture in Mountain View in California of one of the displays. And you look and you go, it doesn't look like great value for $300 million, does it? It's just a screen. But if you look at the numbers that somebody like McDonald's process, so they service 68 million customers a day, and they do two-thirds of that volume through drive throughs But they know, as any of you who are responsible for retail performance will know, they don't get the cross-sell and upsell that you've told all your store staff, you've said, please do this, please sell them this product, and they don't. So they know, they know this isn't happening. But they've deployed this technology to 10,000 locations globally. And now every menu, people think, oh, yeah, McDonald's, fairly standard menu. But now every single customer who drives up gets a different menu. It's personalized at that scale. And it's personalized based on so many different criteria. It's personalized based on the number plate recognition, if it's allowed in your state. It's also personalized based on the time of day, the location, what's in, sto in stock in that particular restaurant. Now, when I ran retail, my closest approximation of personalization at scale was we printed posters with two different sides, and we let the store manager decide which poster to display in their window. So things have moved on an awful lot. But AI is not a single solution. And that's a mistake I think people make. They think, oh, I, I just want to buy the AI and make my business better. But I like this graphic because in the middle, you can see there, this company are saying they're using 20 plus AI models. So it's not just one thing. It's complicated. And what we're seeing and this, I think, is one of my number one trends that we're going to see in the next 12 months. So we've had the first 12 months of ChatGPT. 
Remember what I said about large language models being the thing? We're going to see a load of domain-specific models. So ChatGPT is a very general model. It knows a lot about a lot of things. But we're going to see very specific services that are really, really targeted on one particular feature. So you're going to see people offering large language models that are really good at doing legal questions, or doing procurement questions, or doing marketing, doing learning and development, doing coding. So you're going to see these specific models rather than it all being about generic services. But if you look, remember my three blocks, and we talk about AI, and what's it going to do in the online space? So it's going to change what we already do. It's going to improve customer service with chatbots and with conversational commerce. So in a minute, I'll show you an example of a chatbot that actually offers the consumer something useful. But we're going to have new capabilities. So we're going to have the capability to create new product descriptions that are hyper-personalized. A product description that evolves. Not a product description you put on your website and leave there to grow old. But one that changes every hour of every day as it gets refined, as it gets optimized. But if we take the way chatbots are going, they're going to do the standardish things, so service and support. But you're also going to see much more intelligent chatbots. So this is one called Nibble. And what Nibble lets you do is set some parameters. And then the chatbot will actually negotiate with the customer. And the customers love this, the sense that they're getting a bargain, the sense that they're doing a deal. Customers love that. And it's a different experience from the boring, I go to a page and I click add to basket and I check out. I want to have that opportunity to interact. And that's something that you can add through Shopify or one of those platforms instantly. So this is a technology that's available to a sole trader. This is not the $300 million level menu. This is available to anyone. And that's why I think there's so much excitement in the industry about generative AI. It's because it's no longer technically difficult. You can have it available and affordable to merchants of all sizes. And that's one of the crucial things. There's no new hardware involved for users. So Neil talked about you know, the big infrastructure investment. You don't need to make that. You can just sign up for a service and rent access from all the nice big companies who've spent all the billions of dollars to do this. And if you take an example, so what Amazon have done is they've launched their AI-powered product description pages. And you can now generate a product listing. Just type in what you want. I want to sell a glass. And it will do a, demo, a, a description for you. And it will enhance an image. You can just snap a quick image of your product and then tell it to make it look nice, make it look captivating. You don't need to be a coder. You don't even need to know HTML to run your website to do this. It's all just natural language. And they're seeing a 40% increase in click-throughs as a result of these tools. So Amazon launched their one last month. Google launched their one last night. This is happening, and it's happening at scale. So you can go and just say, I want to get a product description for a mouse pad with a gel wrist. And it will do a description, and it will be optimized, and it will be perfectly formatted. And you can have your product pictures. You can have them brought to life. And they're much more engaging. Every piece of research shows you need higher quality images to get customers in. They do not like dull, flat, boring photographs. It just doesn't work. But if you're a sole trader, it's hard. You don't have a professional photography studio to output new images for you every day. But now you do. You have AI in your corner. And if you think about where it's going, this was a headline I saw a few weeks ago. I said, this, this is a cool headline. I've got to read me this and find out what's happening. 
And if you look at what they do, so what they've done is enabled, again, even small retailers to have an enhanced product listing. So if you imagine this blouse and the little button there, try on models. So part of the problem with online apparel sales is they take a picture of a model and they put that up. But that doesn't account for all the different sizes and shapes that people come in. So that picture doesn't resonate with a lot of customers. But again, you don't have the scale to take a picture of the same piece of clothing on every conceivable model. But now you do, because what Google has done is they've developed a technology that can take the clothing item and a model and show what it will look like on a different model without the need to actually create a photograph of that model. So it can take the product image and any size, shape, color model you want and show you what that will look like. If you're, any, anybody here from marketing or is, are we solidly retail? There's a few, okay. I need to be careful then what I say. So, obviously everyone in retail has a, was gonna say, let, let's go to close relationship with the marketing team. That's the nice way. But the marketing team now, you can replace them all. Because there are now domain-specific large language models. Typeface and WorkMagic are two examples that you might want to try. But you can have them generate a blog post, a product description, an image, a text, or an email. All the things that marketing do, you can have it done for you now. But you can, because this is a domain-specific model, you can actually give it your brand guidelines. Because that's the only thing that ever stops you doing your own marketing, is the marketing team say, no, you have to stick to the brand guidelines. But now you can upload your brand guidelines, and it will generate all of the product imagery in line with your brand guidelines at hyperscale. So every single customer can get a different image it's not like, you know, nice A-B test of a newsletter where somebody gets a slightly different copy. Now you can have a personal image generated with your brand language for every customer. And then in the physical world, so we had the reference earlier to the cashier list, the Amazon Go story. But what else can AI bring us in the physical retail? So it can bring us not only clever things. This was a picture I took in a convenience store in New York where they had LED displays on all their coolers. And they changed, dynamically changed the pricing and the promotions. So they can have AI respond and go, oh, it's cold outside. Let's drop the price of the cold drinks. It's warm outside. Let's put up the price of ice cream. I'm not sure whether that's ethically right to, you know, price gouge, but it can be done. But the other interesting thing, so the real problems, the things that keep retailers awake at night, shrinkage, whether it's intentional or mistaken. There's massive loss of product, whether it's a man, person to check out or whether it's self-checkout. So you have companies now, AI companies like Everseen, who've installed their technology in 6,000 stores, and they're monitoring 80,000 checkout lanes in real time to look for missed scans. And this doesn't require massive investment. So they can connect into your CCTV and monitor whether or not there's shoplifting happening. So this is a feed from a normal CCTV camera. And the gentleman on the left is not a nice man. He's going to try and steal a load of things. So we have our AI watching him. And it, it goes, ooh, item in pocket. It notices when he does the bad things. But it can do that at total scale. It can watch every camera in real time. 
and notify you, okay, item in pocket. It's not a message you want to see. He shouldn't be putting it in his pocket because this isn't an Amazon Go store where that's okay. But it's AI, not generative AI, just computer vision. But it shows the physical store with a genuine enhancement to its operation. And if we go a little bit more creative then, imagine as you worry about the layout of your physical stores. You want to optimize them. That's really hard. You, most people don't have spare stores where they can try things. Some large companies do, they have mock stores, but most people don't. So why not build a digital twin of it? So if you look what Lowe's, the hardware store in the US, what they've done. So they have built, and on the right you have the physical store, and on the left is the perfect digital twin of that store, where they can trial all of the layouts, all of the shelving, all of the products that they want to see. How do they fit in that? They can tie it to their inventory system and they can update where does the stock fit. And then they went further and they said, well, what if we want to actually plan the checkout layouts? What if we want to figure out, would it be better to have more or less self-checkouts? What would that do to the checkout times? And they can run these simulations and they can work out what the optimal store layout is without ever having to physically move anything. So they can rearrange everything in simulation and see how that plays out. And then they can decide, well, actually, we think having another two self-checkouts here will increase or decrease the average checkout time. So it's a very inventive way of applying simulation technology in physical retail. And there are also supply chain things you can do. So from product design and visual merchandising. So you may have been familiar with the kind of numbers that Sheen do. And Sheen is retail at super speed. And it's all done through technology. So what Sheen do is they launch a thousand new products every day. Zara managed 10. And they were previously seen as being really quick. Now, they also allow their suppliers access to their data. So the suppliers can tell in real time what's performing on the website, what isn't. And they can make more of the popular products. And they can take the, so the life cycle of the supply chain down from the five weeks that it takes Zara. And they can do it in three days. So it's an incredible shift and acceleration of operations. But if we go on, can you imagine actually doing all that virtually? Why would you actually have to have the store, the, that complication of running your process. So there's a company called Fashable AI, and they create their entire collection virtually. And then they put it on social media to see what the response is. And then they know which products to make, and they know which ones not to make. But imagine you didn't even have to do that. What if you could skip that test phase and ask generative AI what it thinks. So that's what I did. If you take the picture of the outfit in the middle there, I uploaded that to BARD, Google's equivalent of ChatGPT. That's something a lot of people don't know yet. You can give pictures to ChatGPT and ask it what's in the picture, not just typing in prompts. But I asked it, would that outfit sell to a millennial customer? And it thinks yes. And then it gives me the reasons why. It thinks that it's a unique outfit. It thinks that it's sustainable. It thinks that it's a good fit between formal and informal. So it's analyzed that picture, looked at the market data, and come up with advice for me. 
And then I said, well, that's okay, but I'm not really in the fashion business, nor should I be. But what about visual merchandising? So I gave it another test. So a grocery shelf from a store. And these are tea products. And I uploaded that picture to Bard and to ChatGPT to get its advice. And what Bard came back to me, it said, add more variety, create focal points, use colors, add signage, all pretty sound advice for merchandising. And I know I don't have to hire any more visual merchandisers. I can do it all myself. But it was very clever because it looked at that tea and it was able to read the brands off the boxes. And it was able to say to me, group the lion's tea and the Barry's tea by price, by type. It was able to see what types of tea were on that shelf. And then I asked the same question of ChatGPT. And again, it gave me really sound advice. Walmart, massive, massive retailer, they have started deploying AI in a very creative way. So they've signed up with a company called Pactum AI. And have we any lawyers in the room? Okay, great. So I can, I can speak the truth. What they've been able to do is get rid of a load of procurement lawyers who slow everything down. And they've managed to, by replacing them with an AI, they've managed to get a 3 to 4% reduction in the costs from their suppliers. So the message for me there is that their suppliers prefer dealing with a computer than dealing with their lawyers. That's how bad their lawyers are. But it's one of those things. So that was why procurement was on that list of use cases. What if you have ChatGPT type systems negotiating contracts for you? That's got to be a win. But of course, it's not all without its challenges. We have to be cautious. The old cliche, with great power comes great responsibility. So I was about to give this presentation, or one a bit like it, to a financial services audience a few weeks ago. And I started putting my slides together, and I wanted to do this slide. What's a financial professional to do? What's the que that was the question I wanted to pose. A bit like one earlier where I said, what's retail, what's generative AI going to do in retail? But I wanted to make the slide a bit more exciting, rather than they say, well, great, all he did was a black slide with white letters. He's not very creative. So I said, I'd like to add a nice picture to it. And I said, that's a task for generative AI, because I'm no artist. So I ended up with what I think is a much nicer looking slide, much more visually engaging. But that's not the first image that I got. And this turned into a teachable moment for me, because I ended up with a nice image, but the first time that I asked the generative AI, said, give me a financial professional with a very skeptical face. That was my prompt. That was what I wanted. That was the vision I had in my head. And that is what it gave me. Four millennial white men. And I was like, okay, I gotta take a screenshot of this because that is going to be a two minute segment in my next talk where I'm going to talk about bias in your training data. So there's all manner of things wrong with those four suggestions. But that's what you have to watch out for. The training data, the bias that's in your data. That P back in GPT, the pre-trained. What's in your data? How has that model been fed? And if it's been fed on a diet of out-of-date imagery, your outputs will be of a very low quality. So you've got to be careful for the bias. Now, I did say I'd come back to talk about consumers because AI and retail, it's not all about retailers. I know we like to think it's all about us, but it's not. We have to be mindful of the consumer side as well. And consumers are changing. They have new priorities. They have new relationships with brands. 
They don't care what channel they buy things in. And they have new tools at their disposal, just as you have. And this is where things get a little bit painful because it's so, so easy for all of us to forget if we're a little bit out of touch with our consumers. And we look in the mirror and we think we know our consumers. But unfortunately, our own perception is not necessarily what's really in the mirror. And it's that crucial question. You have to stop and ask yourself, do you know where your consumers are? You know where they're spending their time. So are they on Roblox or Fortnite? Yes. People spend three billion hours a month on these platforms. We mentioned Sheen, how it's taken over fast fashion. Timu is the number one shopping app on the App Store. And most retailers I speak to have never heard of it because they're out of touch with their consumers. And this was, I think, possibly the most frightening one I've seen. So 52% of 18 to 26 year olds get their financial information from TikTok. That's important information. You want that to be coming from a credible source. Consumers also, of course, care deeply now about sustainability. Half of young customers will choose not to purchase a product they want if they're not happy with the environmental provenance of the product. There's technology coming there too. We don't really have time to talk about it today, but there's plenty of technology in the sustainability field that's quite interesting. And the last line there is important. So there is legislation coming at European level requiring that you communicate the sustainability side of your products to consumers. And I mentioned as well that consumers have the access to the same technologies that you have. Consumer can go on ChatGPT and say, should I buy this product? Tell me the pros and cons of this product over that product. So consumers are going to harness this technology and use it against you. So you need to be ready for that. Consumers see this as a positive for them, just as hopefully more of you now feel like it's a positive for you. But as we finish up, I just want to remind people that as exciting as this technology is, it is still about the reason. Why are you using it? AI is not a destination. You should never use it just for the sake of it. It's a tool. You should use it to achieve something. Because ultimately, consumers want service, not science fiction. They won't go, wow, that's a really innovative retailer. I love them. Their patience threshold is really low. They go, yeah, that was cool. And then they'll move on and buy based on the things that matter to them, not based on how much AI you've managed to use. And I've tried to sum things up. This is the part where I kind of said, look at me, I'd like to sound intelligent. I'd like to leave them thinking that guy was smart. So I created my first equation. And my first equation says that AI is not greater than HS where HS stands for human stupidity. We cannot expect AI to solve our problems if we don't use it properly and if we do fundamentally stupid things with it. And as my example of this, this is a real screenshot where I was trying to buy a product, 20 battery lights. They had the product I wanted, in stock at a price I was willing to pay, and then they refused to sell it to me. Said, we're, we're at our order limit for the day, whatever that is. Whatever what a retailer ever thought of having a limit on sales. It's madness, madness. 
So you can't expect AI if you're not running your business with a level of common sense. AI will not be able to save you. And even if after all that, you're not convinced that AI is useful, bear in mind that the AI we have today is the worst AI we will ever have. It will be better next week. And we'd be better again next year. We're still incredibly early in this technology. We're only figuring out how it works. And it will get better and better and better. Which means you need a plan. You need to figure out, not just go home tonight and say, oh, I had a nice day at that conference, or I really wish I wasn't there. You need to go home. You need to figure out what your plan is going to be. Because we've reached what I call the end of Amara's Law. Now, if you've ever heard of Amara's Law, he stated that we tend to overestimate the impact of technology in the short term, and we underestimate it in the long term. So we're back to my wolf, a crying wolf, where we go, oh yeah, it's going to change everything, and then it doesn't. And then five years later, we look back and it actually did. But I think we're at that, the end of Amara's law. It's not relevant anymore. Because with AI, I think we now underestimate the change in the short term. And we grossly underestimate the change in the long term. Because finally, my wolf has met its match. We now have technology that is going to change everything. You need a strategy. There it is, anyone who's quick, it's gone now. If you missed it, you'll have to come up with your own strategy. Why, why should I hand it out to you for free? You can get a copy of the slides from me later if you want. But it, it is a mindset. AI is not a technology. It's an innovation mindset. It's understanding what's changed. It's understanding what the technology landscape now allows you to do that you couldn't do before. But it's about that in the context of your consumers. And it's about understanding the technology, as powerful and amazing as it is, it's within reach. You can buy most subscriptions to so many services for $30 a month. It's not the $300 million product. And I had a boss in retail who taught me everything I knew. And he used to always say to me, Dave, retail is detail. And I was like, yeah, but AI is in both of them. It's there in retail and in detail. So we're back full circle. We brought the wolf back. Now it's time for your poll. I'm not going to ask people who's thrilled, terrified, and trivial. I'm going to ask the people who have changed their minds, put up your hands. I'm not even going to ask you which way you've changed your mind. As long as I've had an impact, I don't really mind which way you've decided. So the summary, so get somebody better than me to summarize. So AI is an extraordinary and groundbreaking technology. The raw material of it, data, is absolutely critical. You should be thinking about what data sources you have. And if you're using AI sources, think about what data they were trained on. What biases might you need to look out for? But the importance of implementing these technologies responsibly really can't be overstated. And that quote is from the investor letter from the CEO of JP Morgan Chase last year. That's how important the financial world sees this and how the retail world sees it. It's time for our panel now. I will leave it there. I hope you found that useful. Thank you all. Благодарим на Дейвид. Дами и господа, ето че стигнахме до момента, в който централно място тук на сцената ще вземат вашите въпроси. Нил, Дейвид и Гавриел със сигурност провокираха вашия интелект и вашите мисли и съм сигурен, че ще имате много въпроси в следващите минути. 
Време е сега за тази част от конференцията, която включва въпроси и отговори. За мен е удоволствие да ви представя водещата на нашата сесия Q&A за въпроси и отговори. Таня Генова, аплодисменти за нея. Тя е директор бизнес развитие, сектор, ритейл. Заповядайте. Моля към нея да се присъединят и нашите експерти, които чухте в предходните минути. Габриел Гита, Нил Телър и Девид Кариган. Те са тук, за да отговорят именно на вашите въпроси относно данните, изкуствения интелект и технологиите в ритейл, индустрията и банкирането. Аплодисменти още веднъж и за тях примата. Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, almost good evening. Dear retailers, customers, our partners from... BP Personal Finance and uh, Post Bank. So, today we already learned that um, AI is bringing incredible opportunities to you, retailers, and that it is transformative for nearly all sectors of the industries, but for retail, it actually brings huge impact. It is estimated and expected to bring around uh, 8 billion uh, GDP uh, in GDP growth by 2024. So this is huge amount and uh, let's really start with uh, our discussion. Um, I would like to invite you to ask questions during the discussion. By the way, some of the questions I have uh, here for um, Gabby, Dave and Neil are actually coming from you. I got them up front. But in order to really bring value to you, I really invite you to, to ask questions if you get curious about something or provoked by our discussion. There is two ladies around that will bring the mics to you. Uh, you can ask questions in Bulgarian. This is uh, not a problem. David and you are already speaking five uh, <laughs> sentences in Bulgarian, so I'll translate for them. Uh, and let's get started. So the first question is to you, David. Um, according to the global Artificial Intelligence Survey of uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, the implementation of AI technologies will bring about 26% in the growth of local GDPs. So having said that, um, how exactly can generative uh, AI boost sales in offline stores? And we speak here namely in the electronic vertical of uh, merchants, and how can it improve the performance of the consultants in the store without the need of human interaction? For the electronic sector is a particularly suitable one, where obviously you have people who are probably a little bit more inclined towards the use of AI, but I think it generally applies quite broadly I don't think there's massive sector-specific uses. I think you'll see the same things translating, where you'll see the visual merchandising that we talked about already being brought to life in a store for electronics as well as every other product. I think you'll also see equipping, to a, a point that Neil made that I thought was particularly interesting, is the internal use of technologies. I think you'll see retailers deploying staff-focused use of chatbots before you'll see them opening it up to the consumer because they'll say, in superpower, I mean, retail, as everybody in the room probably knows, it's very difficult to attract, train, and retain staff. So if you can give them a superpower, you can give them a chatbot who can answer product-related questions and give them prompts, give them nudges on how to cross-sell, how to upsell in a physical store in a way where they can have a more valuable interaction with a consumer. I think that's a really strong use case. Um, and I think it applies across all the different verticals. Okay, thank you. Gabi, you, do you want to add something on this question? No, following up on David, no. No way. No, I think that was a, that was a, that was a pretty full answer. Um, there's a, there's a I, I, I agree, I agree. And it uh, really reminds me of some of your slides in the presentation. So um, it's, it's all already there. Then a question to Neil. Mm. 
what should be done so that the risks related to uh, privacy right breaches are avoided? Ooh, um, okay, so that's a okay, uh, <laughs> complex question. The first thing is to plan. So the collection, of, the collection and the use of data is not a uh, spontaneous thing to do. If, if you act with too much spontaneity, then you will make mistakes and expose yourself to risk. Um, the risk of a data breach is considerable, particularly when you start collecting lots and lots of data. And if it's lots of sensitive data, it's even more um, risk. And the approach to trying to prevent that is a combination of security, um, so encryption and uh, effective control over the data, and then not collecting more than you actually need. Yeah, not creating a great big lake of data that you never actually need or use, but is there as a nice sort of honeypot for somebody to, um, to attack and approach. So I think it's a combination of that uh, uh, privacy by design thinking and effective security. Okay, thank you. Anyone uh, that would like to ask more on these questions, does it satisfy your uh, curiosity from the audience? Or we can move forward. Or any other question for that matter. Okay. <laughs> and I'm coming back to, to David. Um, and this is, this is, for me at least, one of the most controversial topics. So I'm really excited to see what your answer would be. Um, so GDP is expected to grow due to the increase uh, in the workforce uh, using AI technologies. But on the other hand, there are concerns related to job disruptions. You just gave a great example of how um, we can improve the performance of consultants, but does this mean that we substitute them? Does it, it mean that they are laid off? What is your thinking over so that? And, and what, what, this is very important, what, according to you, would be the first role that will be completely substituted by an artificial uh, intelligence? Which industry, when? So you probably won't be surprised to know that you're not the first person to ask that question. It comes up all the time where when you talk about AI, people's fear kicks in about this is going to change my job. This is going to make me uh, unemployed. So it's, it's something I think we need to have a lot of awareness about as we evolve AI and our thinking. I don't see any roles that are in immediate danger of being completely wiped out. But I do think the majority of roles, and I go from um, the, the shop floor all the way to the top executives, everybody is going to have to change how they work. Everyone now has a new tool set at their disposal. And you have to use it, because if you don't, that for me is the risk. Not that your role will be made redundant, but that you'll be replaced by someone who understands how to do your role better using AI. And if you don't embrace the AI, you'll be replaced by someone who does use it. And that, I think, is the biggest takeaway, is it's not about actually reducing the labor number. It's about changing the productivity, harnessing the new tools, and getting more out of it. But I did look, I read an awful lot of reports about AI, and I see a lot of tables predicting what's going to happen. But, and none of the reports, I might read five different reports a week, none of them ever agree. Some of them say it's 10 billion, some say it's 100 billion. It's always a huge number, the impacts. But the one thing that I've actually seen agreement on in the tables is what's a safe career. Because all my friends ask me that. What should I be putting my kids to do? If code is going to be replaced by ChatGPT, I thought that was their career. Fair question. But the one thing, and it, I'm, I'm glad I'm probably towards the end of my career rather than the beginning, because the one report consistency that I see 
there is one category of jobs that is safe, and it's ballet dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I would never have been able to do that. Super great answer, <laughs> great answer. Mm, so, no replacements. This is my takeaway. Just restructuring and generating new skills. Yeah, I think the ones although, I do... Although, uh, actually, just to yeah. come in on that, if, if you live and work in London, you might hope that some jobs are replaced by AI, particularly the tube drivers. The drivers for the underground, <laughs> because they are always on strike. If we can replace them with AI, <laughs> I'll be much happier. <laughs> It's not an official position, by the way. <laughs> Good. It's not endorsed by the company. Not endorsed by Mastercard. <laughs> Gabby, I'm coming to you. In the context of uh, generative AI, um, can you tell us more about the digital payment fraud, scams? Uh, we were laughing uh, in our prep session that probably the most inciting question would be, how can generative AI help me become a criminal without getting caught? Or how can generative AI help me evade taxes? Or things like that. But um, yeah, joke aside, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, digital payments uh, fraud, scams, and actually how the capabilities of AI help us overcome that? Because it is a double-edged sword, right? On the other, on the one end, it gives opportunities for new crimes. On the other end, it gives the cure for those crimes. Um, I think when it comes to payments, um, the one question that we typically need to answer is how much friction do we want in that process? It's typically at the end of everything that the customer does with us, whether they're in store or not. Um, so we want to deal with that pretty quickly. So the natural thing to do is to say, I want this as frictionless as possible. And obviously, if you want it frictionless, so you leave your door open, then somebody might come in and do something bad to your home. While if you lock the door, you may lock yourself out and you will never complete the sale. So it's, it's a question of how much friction do we want to put in that system. That's point number one. Point number two is once you decide how much friction you want, and you can think about friction as additional checkpoints, right? That's what friction does, basically. You know, if you get a customer in the store and they're buying and they're paying in store face to face with the seller, there's friction there. The fact that you're in the store, it's already a friction point, right? You had to get there, taking the tube in London, right? So it's not something you wanted to do. The friction was already there. So, um, but if you're online, then friction means what do I need to know before I decide whether this is legit or not. And typically, you know, here is where you start asking things like passwords, you're asking things like addresses, click here if you're human and that kind of thing, right? So you want to learn things about the customer. So these friction points are necessary and sometimes they're even encouraged by the consumers themselves, right? If you, give, if you make something very frictionless, especially if it's about the payment, um, consumers are not always going to be happy. Oh, it's, it was so easy to spend a thousand euros on that. They will not always be happy with that. But somebody needs to think before they come to that point, what do I need to know about this person? Now, I think the big question here is, can we reduce the friction without losing the security? And that's where the AI comes into play. And that's when you have large data sets that can be used to learn that. I was saying earlier that MasterCard is scoring all transactions that go through our systems. And we're talking about billions and billions of transactions. So each and every one of them is being scored against a set um, of data of fraud patterns and usage patterns and looking at how that particular customer is using what's the expected usage behavior and if all of a sudden you see a customer that it's always been spending locally and they were doing you know uh, 20 merchants typically and not more than 150 euros and all of a sudden they buy something a thousand euros in Singapore that's a red flag I mean it might be cool but maybe it's something that we should be looking at so maybe we should include a an additional friction point there to check it out. So this is something that we've been doing for quite some time. Something that we will be doing is 
to return to return in some way to the merchant, to the retailer, some information about the risk profile of that transaction. We haven't done that before because it's, it's not as easy to do it as it is for the issuer of our payment instruments. Um, but we will start doing that, or we'll start looking into that one. Can we provide more insights to the retailer so that uh, they can take a friction point away while actually making sure that the risk is low. So these are the kind of things that are happening in the payment. And this is only the last part of your checkout process. There are other um, considerations that retailers should take when deciding the risk profile of that consumer. Uh, but only specifically to the payment, uh, these are things that you're, that you're typically doing. Thank you. Thank you, Gabi. Um, going back to you, David, just to be sure you haven't fallen asleep. <laughs> um, so, is there any generative AI use case, specific one, that uh, analyzes the P&L of a retailer uh, that includes insights for the industry average, for performance, KPIs, without the need of uh, human analytics. Actually, this question is coming from, from some of you. Okay, so I, I think it's, it's a great question. It's an obvious one, but I like the thought process behind it that somebody in the audience is, is already trying to see how, do, how is this gonna make a difference to me? How can I use it? I think I'm, I haven't come across a retail um, P&L analysis specific model yet. I think anyone who has it is probably keeping it to themselves. So the big retailers have developed their own. They're not going to make that available as a service, but somebody will. And I think in the interim, there's a question around, you know, would you, with your privacy concerns in place, would you be willing to upload an anonymized P&L to a service and ask it to analyze it and see how it does it. So just because ChatGPT is not, or BARD or any of the other engines, just because they're not specifically tuned for retail, they still have a lot of capability to analyze. So if you take the, the visual merchandising example I gave earlier, that's not a model that's been trained to be a visual merchandiser, but it has enough knowledge to do a good job. So you could put your accounts into a generic engine and ask it to analyze it. And then you know that probably by this time next year, there will be a retail focused model will have been developed. Some startup is gonna see that as an opportunity to sell to retailers or somebody will spin it out of a retail organization and say, well, look, let's actually offer that as a service. Um, so I think that it shows really good thinking about how you can change your approach. You can get more perspective quicker than you know, what would you have done before? A lot of smaller merchants wouldn't be able to afford actual analysis of their accounts. They just do the bare minimum. Am I making money? Am I not? But now you can ask ChatGPT and say, what, what should I do? How, how should I change my business? What are the things I should be worried about? What are the things that you know, I don't want to pay an accountant to find? I can't afford a, a CFO, but you have this tool now that can analyze, and that's you know, a crucial part that these tools, they're not just about entering prompts. You can enter files. You can upload a PDF and say, tell me the, the important five points. I, I'm too lazy to read this. I never do this, obviously, with reports. Upload a report, say, well, what are the five things I need to know? I don't want to read this. Upload accounts. You can upload photographs. You can upload spreadsheets. And you believe that this uh, fully reliable? Because I think that for SMEs, for these solo entrepreneurs, this will be great because um, I think that we are fighting um, all of us, like banks, also big retailers, uh, to teach them how to pay attention on their business, how to analyze, um, how to do marketing and things like that. So 
actually, do you think that ChatGPT is actually giving all these answers, the questions, how reliable this is? I, I think you need to put a layer, the, the human in the loop phrase, you need to put a layer of common sense. You get back an answer from it. You don't just start at number one and go through the list doing everything it said you should do. You critically look at it and you go, well, actually, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. I will make that change to my credit terms or whatever little tweak you want to do for your cash flow. But there's other things where you go, actually, that's not for me. I'll just ignore that. And that's the thing. You can ignore it. You don't have to do everything that the, the model tells you. And you can even feed back. You, I mean, it's again, one of the things that I think people don't necessarily appreciate is you can have a conversation with these systems. Mm -hmm. So you can upload it, say, what, what should I do in this scenario? It'll come back with suggestions. You go, I don't agree with point three, try again. And it will try and rebuild its answer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that ability to say, well, look, yeah, I don't actually agree with that or explain more. Why are you recommending that? Okay, so it's, it's more it's more for now it's re recommendation, but it's very detailed recommendation. So still there there is the need of human interaction, and in the future we will expect that uh, such services will be provided to to big retailers. Uh, discussing on SMEs, one very good question, and I'm also interested to hear the answer. Um, what about cost? and return on investment into implementing, developing, using this uh, artificial intelligence technology. Because everything that we discussed today sounds great. Uh, if we can transform fully our businesses, great. But do we have the money to do that? So I think the most exciting part probably of the technology is how accessible it is. That anybody can get access to incredibly powerful technology and price isn't a barrier. And it I think is that not a barrier. It's not a barrier. There are such systems in place, free systems like Bard and ChatGPT that you can interact with, paid versions that are maybe $10, $20 a month. You know, you, if you can't afford that, you probably have bigger problems with your profitability. Um, and then, yes, there are the more um, specific services like the typeface marketing that I mentioned, but that, that runs into the hundreds of dollars rather than thousands. So it's probably affordable for a lot of people. And I think- But that, but that doesn't take into account the process cost. So you have to think about how do you actually integrate into your operation in a reliable and repeatable fashion. And that I think is, the part not it's, to overlook. It's, it's is, a hidden cost, yeah. isn't it? Where you yeah. sign up for a subscription and then you go, well, actually, it, yeah. it took me a week to, yeah. to write the prompt. It's, it's great that the Amazon Cloud is only $2 per hour, but you know, the fact that I left it running mm. accidentally overnight now means it's you know, yeah. another $20. Or and, but, but I think you know, in, in terms of what you can achieve, so um, a re real world example rather than a kind of made up theoretical one. Um, so the slides for my presentation, um, I would have given a similar presentation on a, a different topic, but similar sc scope of presentation a year ago, um, where I built the slides and I then got a graphic designer to make them look pretty for me. And we paid the graphic designer 3,000 euro to build that slide deck. Now there were 65 slides in it. And when it came time for me to do the next slide deck, I used an AI tool to generate the images. So all of the images in my presentation are AI generated. They're not human generated. Um, and it, it took me, no, I paid for it, but it was $14. Okay. So, so I, I kind of think that's you know, accessible. Um, the return on investment, excellent. Um, okay. But I think it's it also for that, though, to, to Neil's point, there was the process. But I actually enjoyed the process. <laughs> I enjoyed the fact that rather than outsource my slides, I could ask it, get back an image, not like the image, and then just type in another we're, prompt. We're, we're training ourselves how to work with AI. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Neil, uh, challenges that AI technologies implementation and um, ecosystem is facing? What are the challenges? I think challenges. you covered most of them, but if you can really <coughs> pinpoint the three biggest challenges. 
Um, yeah, I think the, the first is probably the regulatory environment, actually. Uh, regulatory. We, haven't, we haven't regulation. We haven't spoken about that too much today, but actually the regulation environment is changing still at the moment. There's a lot of flux. It's not stable. So actually making investment decisions in AI today does carry a little bit of risk because you don't know necessarily what will be permitted or not permitted or how or is the open AI model that you're going to use today the right one. That's probably one area. Um, yeah, the, the, we've spoken about the challenge of process, actually how do you integrate it into your operations um, and then how do you then kind of trust and guarantee the outcome. So that framework that we were talking about before as to, okay, how do you deploy it? And therefore, how do you have trust yourself that the models and the AI that you're going to use are actually going to do a good job for you? Yeah, they're not going to upset your customers. They're not going to start an argument about, you know, the price or something like that. Yeah, because they've learned to argue. <laughs> Short Super answer. Super great. Yeah. So I, I think that, uh, I don't know, we, if it will be that easy for people to start trusting this. I think it's a whole new innovative yeah. mindset, as you name it. I think it will take a while until the owners of uh, artificial intelligence technologies can imply them in their businesses without any, any scare. Okay, Gabi, uh, one more for you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the remote uh, aspects of the com uh, commerce and how, what are the, let's say, the, the trends, the solutions, the AI technology implementations that can help uh, the remote commerce be secure, trusted, um, and this is really following what we are just discussing, so that the retailers themselves can focus on their core business, take um, decisions on uh, their important matters and uh, be sure that their customers will trust the payment. Let me pretend that this is the first time I'm hearing this question. Excellent question, Tanya. Um, right, so it's, it's, it's pretty much... It's taken over where we left it with the, with the previous question. Um, and it's more specific now to e-commerce, right? Um, in digital commerce, um, the seller and the buyer, they're not in the same space, so they need to find a way to trust each other. Uh, I was speaking earlier on about the payment piece, which is the last one of the process, um, but I think it makes sense to um, cover a bit what happens before the payment. Um, and um, you know, typically things that happen before you reach to the payment stage, um, consumer is creating an account with, let's say, with the seller. It can be the bank or it can be anyone else. Of course, the process can be more complex, but let's say it's an easy one. You're an or, uh, online, uh, online seller and you are creating an account for your, for your customer. At that time, you're typically asking your customer for an email address, uh, maybe an address, uh, and that's about it. Um, that's typically not enough for the seller to gain trust in that consumer. So um, there are things that can be done, clearly not, um, how should I say, not things that the online retailer should develop by themselves because it takes knowledge which is kind of sp specific to this. This is not their core business. So. Correct. But, but there are you know, companies out there like payment processors, acquirers, and et cetera, or even, let's say, side businesses uh, that are feeding into these ones which can help the retailers build that kind of confidence. Um, there are some basic things like the email address can be checked against like a big database of... Uh, bad events, you know. Has this email address been associated with, with any bad events anywhere else in the world? Because there are, believe it or not, there are, um, there are ways to record that. If it's about a phone number, you know, has this phone number been ever associated with fraudulent events? Uh, these are kind of like basic things that, uh, basic things that can be done. But these are those are solutions that actually help merchants improve. Correct. Yeah, okay. Correct. Existing and they're, already and they're not even AI driven, right? They're, they're much easier than that. They're much simpler than, than that. Or things like, uh, this is the customer's um, IP address. Has, been, has this been ever reported of being engaged with um, fraudulent uh, activities okay. and so on? 
more complex things that can be done, um, especially when consumer shops on their personal device, like their phone, um, there can be further checks to see uh, if that's your consumer, even before asking them for a password or anything like that. By the way, they hold the phone, they use the phone, they swipe, they type. These are, uh, these are behavioral aspects uh, which can be captured, right? And profiles can be built. Of course, user consent is always there. They know that they're doing this for their own good. Uh, and they say, yes, I want you to Have be able to see that. Have voluntarily agreed that Google Correct. is listening to me and knowing how I move my... Correct. Yes. Correct. Uh, and, and this is also something that is out there. So there are companies which are doing this. Um, typically, uh, uh, typically uh, available f again from maybe payment processors or acquirers, or maybe buying from third parties and embedding them in the retailer's mobile app, and that can give confidence that this particular user is who they say they are, even before you're asking the user to do like more friction-based type of actions. Um, so I would say that these are rather easy strategies which are readily available. Uh, in the market that can be done to get to, um, let's say, confirm that trust. And then this is coming back to the friction. If you can do, uh, if you can solve the friction in smarter way without asking the customer to do something that maybe they're not, I don't know, able to do for some reason, um, but you can solve it in With a, a very outcome. consistent way and very secure way and you don't need the friction point to happen anymore, then that's, I think, a plus for everybody. Thank you. Um, I see people waving at me saying, I think get, way out above. Of the, <laughs> get out of the stage. So I will thank you. But before that, really, is there any question that you would like to ask? And uh, even if... Uh, uh, you you are not going to ask it now. You can we take have a advantage. Winner, Tanya. Yeah, <laughs> we great, have super. A winner. Um, very briefly, uh, some question. Uh, first, thank you for uh, super. Thank you, thank you for this uh, very rich presentation. Uh, very pragmatic and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, examples that you have shown. So really, thank you for this one. Um, one thing that you have in common. Uh, in your business is that you have uh, very good visibility on retail and on finance, which is quite good because it's what we are. Um, one concern that I have is that um, when we speak about uh, generic AI and advanced uh, things, this can be a natural barrier for somebody who didn't try yet anything because maybe it sounds too complex. Uh, a lot of use cases we see heavy investment from McDonald's, for example, to personalize the customer experience. Um, and if we have to take away for somebody who tomorrow returns in the business as usual and has the business as usual problems, yet if we take away uh, two examples, for example, very pragmatic, not from the productivity point of view or content uh, creation point of view, but from customer point of view, how to understand better the customers or how to improve the customer experience, what are the uh, small yet very efficient use cases that you can recommend for everybody in order to sample, to try AI, not necessarily generative AI, which is uh, uh, the, the new trend and uh, definitely is going to be the powerful tool uh, for the future to come, uh, but generally speaking in data analytics uh, world? <laughs> I would say the first thing is probably Ask your customer if they uh, consent to you finding out more about them. And in exchange, you will give them a better service. So actually, you know, there's a lot of services out there. Um, you know, we have the ability as well. So you know, if you do not know much about your customer, ask them and say, hey, do you mind if I go and find out more about you? Uh, if you don't mind, please you know, give me your card number and then I can find out more about you and offer you a better service. Um, understanding if your particular customers are accepting of that approach, and it varies across different retailers. Some get a very high response rate to that, some get a very low response rate. 
But that's probably the first and the easiest because you it's can to, then go and get it's more it's information. To collect the consent, it's to get the data. Practically. Just get the data in the first place, absolutely. Ask if you can first, ask if they'll even let you. And then secondly, um, fig figure out what, you know, what is going to be different once you actually know something about that customer or know a little bit more about them. Is it that you're going to offer them a slightly different product? Is it that you're going to offer them a slightly different experience? Or is it that you're going to try and maybe retain them for additional loyalty or something like that? So if there's one strategy you're going to do once you know a little bit more about that customer, because I think both of those you can do almost very manually. You, know, you don't have to have lots of technology and tools and things. It can be a very you know, straightforward process. You can just sample it with a thousand customers on a spreadsheet. Yeah. So, so maybe kind of uh, trying to see recurrent repetitive sales, for example. Uh, uh, absolutely. And yeah, again, there are, there are many services that yeah, we can do around that. Would you like to add something? Or? I think we're being told to. <laughs> OK, then. Um, anyone else volunteering on that? Or you can take advantage of our uh, we'll around, great yeah. Yeah, uh, guests and uh, ask them in the during the cocktail. Thank you. Yeah.